Hey there, welcome to the Lore to Death podcast, a deep dive into the lore of your favorite games, movies, shows, and more. My name's Brett, and today I want to talk about something that might be a little obscure. I'm not sure if many people have really heard of this phenomenon, but I wanted to take a minute to talk about April Fool's Day. This is when, on the 1st of April, folks tend to channel their inner Loki and create a variety of hoaxes, pranks, and ruses on their fellow people. And just in case you can't tell, of course, I'm joking. Everyone knows about April Fool's Day. And while this is a worldwide phenomenon, I don't think I've ever actually really experienced any pranks on behalf of April Fool's Day. And yet, I still feel on edge every day this year, like something terrible could happen. I could sit down at my office and my chair could be full of tacks. My desk could be covered in post-it notes. My cat could be replaced with a hyper-realistic cake. Anything could happen, and yet it never does. I always wondered what the cultural significance of April Fool's Day was and why it was so prominent when it seemed like nothing had ever happened to me on April Fool's Day. So now that I've made a habit of writing an essay every couple of weeks, I think it's time to buckle down and get to the bottom of this mystery, if there even is a bottom. And I'm not going to lie, there is a ton of conflicting information out there on the history of April Fool's Day. It's hard to tell which is right and which is a hoax, which I guess goes right in line with the theme of the day. For my perfectionist brain, that makes it exceedingly difficult to write this episode because I don't know who to trust. And I guess maybe that's the point. When I'm writing about a game or a movie, everything is pretty cut and dry. Usually the information is right out there, unless it's something like Dark Souls or when I did my Bloodborne episode, it was a lot of writing and filling in the gaps. But at least the information was there, and I knew that what I was saying wasn't necessarily wrong. It was just maybe a different interpretation of it. But writing about April Fool's Day was a bizarre experience, and this is because everyone has their own kind of idea of how it might have started, but I don't think any people were actually correct. I think it's Charlie Day from Always Sunny in Philadelphia connecting the lines of conspiracy theories. You know that episode? You know that meme? But... You'll see what I mean in a minute. Since I don't really have any experience with April Fool's Day personally, I don't really have a preamble, and I'm just going to get right into what we think is the originating point. And so some people seem to think that this modern custom originated in France in the year 1564 with the Edict of Roussillon. This edict was brought about when King Charles IX of France was traveling around his kingdom, visiting various territories as was his kingly duty. Of course, during this time, the most prominent form of worship was Christianity, and so the king realized that each diocese was doing things a little bit differently in regards to New Year's celebrations. Depending on the diocese, some would start their New Year at Christmas, like in Lyon, for example, while others would start their New Year on Holy Saturday, which was the Saturday between Good Friday and Easter Monday, somewhere between the end of March and the beginning of April, depending on the year, while some just stuck with March 1st or March 25th as their new year. The first two dates make some semblance of sense, being surrounded by arguably the two most important dates for Christianity, Christmas and Easter. Both of those dates being very holy occasions, I can see why they would want to start a new year on those days in accordance with their worship. March 1st and 25th, though, were definitely lesser holy days, and I'm not sure exactly why they would have been chosen to mark the new year. I guess the 25th could be in line with that Easter Saturday somewhere. It just seems weird that they would pick the 25th in particular. March 1st is St. David's Day, which marks St. David's death in 589 AD. March 25th is a bit of a mixed bag. It's the day of the Feast of Annunciation, which is the day where the Archangel Gabriel visited the Virgin Mother Mary to tell her that she was going to be the mother of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And on the flip side of that, this is also the day that the Christian antiquity held as the actual day of Jesus' death. So I guess maybe I could see why they would choose the 25th, seeing as it's the day where they knew that the Son of God would be born and the day that the Son of God was dead. I don't know. This seems kind of morbid, but, you know, whatever floats your boat. Regardless of their reasoning, it was all in line with significant dates for Christians, is what I'm getting at. It looks like there was one, maybe two territories in France that held January 1st as their new year, which was in the vast minority. 
But seeing all of these different dates, King Charles IX decided that he was going to standardize the new year and pick one day in France, which they would celebrate the new year. And so he decided to choose January 1st in line with the Gregorian calendar. And the edict was in effect on August 9th, 1564. And the first standardized New Year celebration took place on January 1st, 1565. I thought that maybe King Charles chose January 1st because maybe that's how it was done where he was born. But it doesn't seem like that was the case. From what I can tell, he was born in a northern province, but the only ones to celebrate New Year's on January 1st were those in the south. So it must have just strictly been a Gregorian calendar thing, because like I said before, the provinces that chose to celebrate New Year's on January 1st were in the vast minority. And I think actually the majority of the provinces celebrated on Easter Saturday. So do with that what you will. All right, that was kind of a major detour into Christianity, and I apologize, so let's get back on track. King Charles IX standardized the New Year, but what does that have to do with April Fool's Day? Because many people celebrated their New Year around Easter before the Edict of Roussillon, some people still clung to this day as their New Year because that's all they had ever known, and I think that's entirely reasonable. Imagine if they told us that they were changing the New Year date today. Would you change your ways, or would you still celebrate on January 1st? If it were me, I think January 1st is always going to be my New Year's Day. I'm always going to celebrate on December 31st because that's all I've ever known for my 20-some-odd years of life. So, I kind of get it. Because Easter is a lunar holiday, that means that it changes dates every year, and, like I said before, fell somewhere between the end of March and beginning of April. And so these people who celebrated New Year's at Easter still were referred to as April Fools for clinging to the old ways. The people who would celebrate New Year's at the correct time on January 1st would organize celebrations, meetings, gifts, and stuff like that to prank people who still celebrated New Year's on Easter. And so they were literally just making fools out of them. And this is kind of the prevailing theory as to where it might have started coming from in the quote unquote modern day. And it's funny that I keep seeing people refer to this as like modern April Fool's because it was in the 1500s. I don't really understand how the 16th century has anything to do with modern day, but that's besides the point. Although I guess to that point, I guess it's still modern in comparison to the entire history of the world. So eh, historians can have this one. Others speculate that the tradition actually goes back as far as ancient Rome and the festival known as Hilaria. This was a celebration of the March equinox, which honored Cybele, who was a national deity who was similar to Gaia of Greek mythology. Kind of a Mother Earth figure, it seems. However, it also seems that Hilaria was a title given to celebrate basically anything and wasn't actually specific to the March equinox celebration. And so this specific date was known as Hilaria Matris Deum, which in English kind of means Hilaria Mother of God, it seems. So, of course, if you know about the March equinox, then you know why this would be a significant date to have a massive festival. This is the date in which it was the first day of the year that the day is longer than the night in a transition from winter to spring. And in celebrating spring, that's why they're celebrating Sibel, the goddess of earth and mother of gods. This was a great festival with plenty of games and other charades, such as masquerades, where everyone, in disguise, would be able to imitate whomever they pleased, even magistrates, which would have been blasphemous during any other occasion. It's hard to say when this festival originated, though. The first writings that I can find about it were from Salustius in the 4th century AD, who wrote on the account of the multi-day structure of the festival. And at first we ourselves, having fallen from heaven and living with the nymph, are in despondency and abstain from corn and all rich and unclean food, for both are hostile to the soul. Then comes the cutting of the tree and the fast, as though we were also cutting off the further process of generation. After that, the feeding on milk, as though we were being born again, after which come rejoicings and garlands and, as it were, a return up to the gods. Which I have to admit makes no sense to me. It sounds like basically they fast, there's something about a cutting of a tree, and then they 
start drinking milk and become gods. I don't really understand. But this is the first kind of account that we have that I can find about Hilaria or about this festival in general. So this is really all we have. It, it kind of seems wild. The other accounts of masquerades and parties and parades kind of come from other accounts, but I just thought this one was interesting. Anyways, because of the joyous nature of the festival and the fact that it was around the end of March leads some to believe that this was the start of April Fool's Day, especially because of the masquerades and people were known to prank each other and pull each other's limbs, as it were. Although there's really no correlation other than the sort of date and the fact that they put on masquerades where people tended to mess with each other a little bit. I think it's a bit of a stretch, but it's worth mentioning nonetheless. Another really weird theory is a disputed association with April 1st being a fool's day. And this one is from Jeffrey Schausser's The Canterbury Tales, which is a collection of 24 short stories written between 1387 and 1400 AD. In one of these stories called Nun's Priest's Tale, a proud rooster, and I can't ignore how he's described as a vain cock because... Come on, you could have just said Proud Rooster. Anyways, this Proud Rooster named Chanticleer is tricked by a fox on a day referred to as Since March Began 30 Days and Two. So we all know that March has 31 days. And so 30 days and two, that would equal up to 31 days plus one April 1st, right? Now, I cannot begin to recap this story because it's just absolute nonsense. And if there are any Schauser fans in here, I will fight you on that. The moral of the story is that the rooster was far too proud and far too gullible. And so the rooster was the fool on March 32nd, which is actually April 1st, because, again, as we know, there is no such thing as March 32nd. I think the real fool is Schauser, because, again, this is all just nonsense, but that's my opinion. Some people think that this is an early revelation of April Fool's Day. And some people think that it's actually a translation error meant to say 32 days after March was over, which would actually push it way forward to May 2nd. But alas, we shall likely never know the true answer, as some of these translations are just lost in translation. I think that the most popular theory is that it dates back to the Roman Empire during the reign of Emperor Constantine. As per the tale, a group of jesters convinced Constantine to make one of them a king for a day. And, funnily enough, Constantine obliged them. What could possibly go wrong, he thought. A jester by the name of Kugel was appointed king for a day, and he decreed that this day would be a day of jollity. And that day, of course, was April 1st. And so, of course, a jester's day, April Fool's Day, kind of makes sense, right? But there's one glaring issue with this story in that it was revealed to be a prank by Boston University professor Joseph Boskin that was pulled on an Associated Press reporter named Fred Bales in 1983. Bales reported the story and Associated Press ran it only to retract it later when it turned out to be a hoax. At least this theory outed itself as a host and it's not trying to be something that it isn't. But like I said before, this is a good example of how trying to do research for a national prank day is going to be a mixed bag of fact and fiction. There are a couple smaller theories on the origins, ranging from Druidic rites in Britain to the Indian Festival of Holly, but it doesn't seem like these are any more concrete than Hilaria or Schauser's story. And with that being said, there are clear references of playing pranks and fooling people as early as around the late Middle Ages which you could trace back to around 1400 AD. But the first clear reference that we actually have for the idea of April Fool's Day was from 1508. A French poet named Eloy d'Amerville made a reference to a poisson d'avril, which means April fish in French. You might shake your head at the notion because fish does not equal fool, but the French are a funny bunch. From what I can tell, it's a sort of tradition that on April Fool's Day in France, you get a handful of paper fish, and your goal is to stick those fish to the back of as many people as you can, and then run away screaming, Poisson d'Avril. So, the fact that this is still going on to this day, as far as I can tell, means that the reference by poet Eloy d'Amerville 
was likely the first proper actual reference to April Fool's Day. And so further on the point as to why so many of these theories are wrong or misleading is that Poisson d'Avril was a known thing at the time in 1508, which means that it had probably been going on for some time, which means that the Middle Ages and the 1400s is actually probably more correct. But that also goes to say that it predates the whole spiel with King Charles in France by like 60 years. So everything is unreliable. Everyone thinks they know everything and nothing is true as per the theme of April Fool's Day. But all of that aside, we really don't know the true origins of April Fool's Day. It is somewhat of a mystery to everyone. I really hope that one day we actually find the concrete answer. But also, I kind of don't. Because if we find the concrete answer, then that's kind of no fun. I feel like April Fool's Day being a mystery is kind of fun because, again, it's in line with the holiday. But it could be any one of these theories or it could be none of them at all. One passage in a series called Poor Robin's Almanac puts it best. The first of April, some do say, is set apart for all Fool's Day. But why the people call it so, nor I nor they themselves do know. But what we do know is that by the 1700s, this holiday was known pretty well all around the world. By 1771, we have proof that the holiday was known in Canada and New England, and in Connecticut by 1796. So April Fool's had made its way all the way from, at the very least, France to North America in a couple hundred years, which means pretty much everywhere. But everywhere in the world did the holiday a little differently. The gist still remained the same, though. In Ireland, it was tradition to entrust a victim with an important letter. That person would read the letter, and the victim would take it to someone else, until eventually it had passed through numerous hands and probably ended up in a garbage bin somewhere. Inside the letter would read, send the fool further, which is extremely tame for what I assumed Ireland would do, but I digress. In Poland, they take Prima Aprilis very seriously to the point where people believe that anything said on April 1st could be a hoax, and to the point where the Polish anti-Turkish alliance with Leopold I signed on April 1st, 1683, was actually backdated to March 31st so that none could dispute its legitimacy. So official documents couldn't even be signed on April 1st because you can't trust anything signed on April 1st. In Ukraine, it sounds like there are festivals that happen in town centers where there are all sorts of entertainment from concerts to street fairs and performances, along with typical pranking on passersby. They are even known to dress up statues in funny clothes, which I think is harmless and fantastic. While I couldn't find anything particularly unique, uh, there's even word that it was celebrated as far as Israel and Lebanon. But again, while everyone does it a little differently, there's one thing that seems pretty consistent in the day's affair, and that is any pranks played after 12 p.m. noon on April 1st are seen as rude or untimely. I've seen this noted in Poland, the UK, and North America, to name a few places, and I even remember hearing about this when I was growing up, even though, again, I never really saw much pranking happen at all before noon or otherwise. But I do specifically remember my teachers mentioning that if you're going to play a prank, do it before noon, because if you do it after noon, then you get detention. I wonder why this is, though. I couldn't find any actual explanations except for old publications mentioning something about custard pies and lies, which sounds about right for publications coming from like the 1800s. So I'm not exactly sure why this rule exists, but it seems like most people tend to follow it. And instead of cutting this episode short, I wanted to give my top five April Fool's Day pranks of all time. There are a lot out there, and I'm sure that as I hear more as the years go on, my list might change. But I want to welcome you all to share your favorite pranks with me. Feel free to send me a message on Instagram, where I'm most active, or send me an email at lordtodeath at gmail.com. You can even use the Spotify Q&A function if you're on Spotify. That's where I seem to get most of my recommendations. Whether it's something that you've done, something that was done to you, or countless other famous pranks that have happened throughout history, I would love to hear what your favorite April Fool's Day prank is. And without further ado, here are mine. At number five, we have a very simple but hilarious one. At least, to me, it's hilarious. In 1992, 
NPR decided to broadcast a spot with Richard Nixon himself saying that he would be running for president again later that year. Um, as it turns out, they hired an impersonator or an actor who managed to fool quite a few people into thinking that Richard Nixon was actually going to run for president again like 20 years later. If you know American politics, I don't think this one needs much explanation at all, considering, you know, Watergate. Like I said, it's a very simple hoax, but one that I'm sure gave people a bit of a jump start in their morning. If you want me to cover Watergate in a future episode, <laughs> let me know. No, no, please don't. No, I'm not. No, I'm not doing that. No. Um, the number four slot goes to a ridiculously inappropriate joke. If you are a child listening to this, maybe don't listen to the next like 30 seconds. But this one comes from everyone's favorite pastime, Pornhub, who in 2016 changed their name and branding all over the site to Cornhub and featured videos of corn on their site instead of the usual affairs. But when one was to click on a video of corn shucking or something, they would be redirected to the world famous Never Gonna Give You Up by internet hero Rick Astley. On top of an already fantastic joke featuring corn everywhere on one of the most trafficked sites on the internet, having the classic meme pop up is just icing on the cake. I had to include this one, even though it is extremely inappropriate. I just I think this is amazing. In my number three spot, we have one that hits close to home here in Canada. In 2008, CBC radio program, As It Happens, interviewed a Royal Canadian Mint spokesperson. And much to my disappointment, Royal Canadian Mint is not a maple syrup flavored mint, but rather the mint that produces all of Canada's circulation coins. Although they should really make a mint for April Fool's Day as a joke. I think that would land really well. If you're out there listening, just saying, fantastic idea. Anyways, the spokesperson broke news about plans to replace the $5 bill with a $3 coin, which they were going to dub the Threeny. If you don't know, our $1 and $2 coins are called the Looney and Toony, respectively. The Looney is called a Looney because it has a loon on the one face, and the Toony, well, it's two loonies, so it's a Toony. But because our $1 and $2 coins are named as such, I could genuinely see the Threeny happening at some point. I think that this is a fantastic hoax, and the fact that I could see them doing something like this makes the hoax that much better, because it's actually believable. Number two has to go to another that hits close to home for my fellow left-handed heretics. In 1998, Burger King published a full-page advertisement in USA Today announcing that they would be introducing a new line of burgers designed for the 32 million left-handed Americans, the left-handed Whopper. As we know, left-handed folks have a hard time doing a lot of things. Writing in spiral-bound notebooks, using fountain pens, cutting with scissors, and eating hamburgers. Those are the main ones. They noted that all of the condiments would be rotated 180 degrees, therefore distributing the weight of the sandwich so that the bulk of the condiments would skew to the left, thereby reducing the amount of lettuce and other toppings from spilling out the right side of the burger. Absolutely incredible. Even though it was just a hoax, apparently Burger King locations across the United States had customers come in and try to order their own left-handed Whopper, and even had people come in to request that they get a regular right-handed Whopper so that they didn't run into spillage issues with their favorite handheld heart attack. Once again, a very simple and clean hoax, and I love it. And finally, number one has got to be the exceedingly elaborate spaghetti tree hoax. I feel like everyone knows this one, but it's worth going over for those who don't. In 1957, the BBC program Panorama showed a three-minute-long report on April 1st. The report showed a family in Switzerland who, after a mild winter, was having a bountiful harvest of spaghetti after the virtual disappearance of the natural pasta pests, the spaghetti weevils. A woman was shown picking cooked spaghetti noodles off of a tree branch and putting them in a wicker basket, which is extremely unsettling if you haven't seen it. It looks like an episode of Twilight Zone, but they talked about the trials and tribulations of breeding the perfect strain of spaghetti so that they got the optimal noodle length from their harvest. At the time, around 7 million homes in Britain had cable receivers, which means that just under half of Britain was able to tune into this obscene broadcast. BBC had hundreds of call-ins from viewers to either question the authenticity of the program or to simply ask how they can get their hands on a spaghetti tree seed and starter kit. 
This amazing pitch came from the freelance operator Charles de Jaeger, who got the idea from one of his teachers back in Austria, who would tease students for being so stupid that if they were told spaghetti grew on trees, they would believe it. I think this one's brilliant because at the time spaghetti wasn't very popular in Britain. And so some people genuinely had no idea that noodles didn't come from trees. The fact that people called in asking how to get their own spaghetti trees makes this hoax one of the greatest hoaxes of all time, in my opinion. And that about does it for today's episode. So what have we learned today? I think that we've learned that you can't trust everything you hear, especially on April 1st. We've also learned that sometimes the simplest hoaxes are the most impactful. But sometimes it takes making an entire BBC broadcast about spaghetti plants to make the greatest hoax. I think what truly makes a great lie is being able to find some semblance of truth in the lie, which makes something like the three-knee or the left-handed whopper believable and interesting. And something that makes the spaghetti tree so hilarious because it's so out there that you wouldn't think there would be any sort of truth or fooling people, but people amaze me every single time. I think I've also learned that being a historian must be incredibly mentally taxing. This is the first real-world event that I'm writing a story on, and I could see it being my last, if I'm being entirely honest. There's something about writing about a work of fiction that makes it fun and interesting, and somehow almost all of that is lost on me writing about the real world. History class was my favorite in high school, but I'm not sure that I'm so keen to start writing history episodes. I just want to stick to my Halo and my Mass Effect and my Bioshock. Writing about fictional worlds is just something about it makes it feel so much better. And don't get me wrong, writing this episode was still fun and interesting. I learned a lot that I can actually use in actual conversations. But it really did feel like just being in high school again, writing essays. And not sure if I loved that. But again, if you want to share your own April Fool's Day hoaxes or stories, then you can find us online at lord to death on your favorite social media apps or at lord to death at gmail.com. You can also find me on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have any suggestions for topics, please send me a message wherever you can find me. If you're using the Spotify app, there is a Q&A function attached to the episode where you can submit any questions or topics. I would love to hear from you. And remember, don't believe anything that anyone tells you today unless it's afternoon. Be safe, have a happy April Fool's Day, and I'll lure you to death in the next one. See ya.